How can you heal from childhood sexual abuse by a family member? This is Ask a Therapist, Men in Light. Welcome to Ask the Therapist here on our Mended Light YouTube channel. Joining me today are Jessica Manio and Chase Brewer. Members of our therapeutic team here at Mended Light. And uh, we get silly a lot in these videos. We're probably not going to get too silly today because this is heavy and this is raw and this is real. Because, mm -hmm. you know, growing up, you hear about stranger danger, right? Beware of strangers. And, and the idea I had growing up was that if someone was going to kidnap me or hurt me, it was going to be somebody that I didn't know who was luring me into a van with candy. And statistically, it's more often what? Family, family members. members. Yeah. It's more yeah. often a family member uh, or a friend of the family, but somebody that you bring into your home, somebody that you trust. Right. And an example I point out to is those Amber Alerts that you get mm -hmm. more often than not. Oh, it's yeah. a family member that yeah. is, you know, uh, a mother or father taking their child away from the other spouse. Yeah, yeah, that is usually what it is for sure. And even when it's not, it's it's almost always somebody in the circle. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so it's hard, it's hard as an understatement. It's devastating as a child. The adults in your life are meant to make you feel safe, right? Or your older siblings, like these, these are my people. And I had that growing up. I had safe parents, I had safe siblings, I had safe relatives. Nobody tried to touch me inappropriately. Nobody tried to do anything that made me feel uncomfortable. And I always kind of expected that as the default. And to think about people for whom that wasn't what they had. To think about children, innocent children, who are told to keep secrets, who are, told, who are either threatened or coerced or manipulated into doing things that make them feel uncomfortable or that confuse them, and that there's shame brought into that or that there's secrecy brought into that or that there's actual fear of violence brought into that is heartbreaking. Very much so. That's an understatement. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a huge understatement. This is, this is an area of expertise for you, is it not? Yeah, I spent many, many years working with children who had experienced situations like this. And devastating, heartbreaking, all those words certainly apply. What are the first steps towards healing? You, you meet with someone like that, that's their situation. What do you start with? I mean, when I specifically was doing that for years, it was with very young children. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you always want the child to understand it's not their fault. That, um, first of all, that it's not okay. Yeah. It's not their fault. They don't need to feel shame. And of course, that's really hard when you're six or seven years old to, yeah. to understand. And I think all of us can agree we now see, working with adults, we see the fallout of that. Yeah. You know, when this has been experienced when you're a child, we now work with clients who, who are dealing with the repercussions of that as adults. Well, and, and destigmatizing and taking away the shame. Yeah. Because my understanding of child psychology is we want to feel safe as children. Yeah. And so if there's an adult in my life who's hurting me, I want to believe that this adult is safe. Mm -hmm. And if they're acting in a way that's unsafe or scary or hurtful, it's because of me. Yeah, it must be my fault. It must be my fault because if it's my fault, yeah. I can fix it. Yeah. I can make it stop. Yeah. I, can, I, can make, I can make it stop and make them happy. Because yeah. what if I'm, as a child, sitting with the fact and realization, no, this person just isn't safe. Well, I have no recourse. Yeah. Then I'm just stuck in an unsafe situation, right? And so it's, it's so much easier to internalize, mm -hmm. this is my fault. Yeah, and that's exactly what kids do. It's, it, which is why children, And their abusers feed into it. Yeah, 100%. And that's why kids, you know, of course, as adults, we think like, oh, well, you know, we always talk like you need to tell somebody if somebody's um, touching you inappropriately or doing things that are making you feel unsafe. But for kids, unfortunately, statistically, we know this and anecdotally, anecdotally, I know it to be true in the work I used to do. They don't tell because like you said, well, these are my, my safe adults. Yeah. You know, they're there to keep me safe. They're there to protect me. And if they're doing things that don't feel okay, something's wrong with me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it takes different, different shades, different flavors, right? Because there are people who sexually abuse children in a way that is violent and threatening and scary and if you tell anybody I will hurt you or I will hurt them and then the kids are terrified and then there's the other way which is hey we're we're buddies we're or you know we love each other this is just part of it cuz and they and the abuser is taking advantage of the child's innocence and ignorance mm -hmm. and then you wouldn't want to get me in trouble would you yeah. right that it's mixed up with very real attachment and the child feels love for their abuser because it's all just confusing like they don't know how the world works mm -hmm. and then they get older and it sinks in what has actually happened. 
and there's a lot of hurt there, a lot of rage there. There's yeah. still a lot of shame, but then there's also a lot of, you know, I can't believe that this was my reality. Well, and you know, with that, if, especially when it's a trusted family member or friend, often the anger and rage also comes towards the other adults that were around that didn't protect them. Yeah. You know, you get older and you realize, wait a second, that was not okay, but my mom was yeah. a bystander and let yeah. it happen. And then it's like, how do you reconcile that? That it's like, but I love my mom. My mom was really loving yeah. to me, but wait a second. Well, like, and I, I sometimes, it's how could you not see? How could you yeah. not see this happening? Other times you knew and yeah. you did nothing. And you didn't protect me. I had, a, I had a client one time who told me that her mom had told her as a child, we can leave. We can leave your father, but then you won't have a dad mm -hmm. and we might not have a place to live. Yeah. And put it on this child, like to make that decision. To make that decision. For the family. If you say wow. that, uh, that we need to leave, then we can leave. But I'm letting you know this is what's going to happen. And so the child who's already been victimized mm. is now placed with the burden of this because the parents too terrified to take that step. Mm -hmm. You know. So how do we heal from this? What are the steps? First of all, like you said, taking away the shame. Yeah. Right. Which is not as simple as saying it's not your fault. Yeah. It's often saying that a lot of times mm -hmm. and helping them to really internalize it and to really feel it. I think, an, I don't know if it's the next step, but it's an important step is helping the person feel safe now. Yeah. I was just thinking that. Yeah. And I don't know what the timeline is of when you suffered this abuse, if it was two years ago or five years or 10 years ago. Right. right? But at any point we need to establish a sense of safety, mm -hmm. not just in the, in the therapeutic office, but in that environment, your home environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe you're away for college and you go back for Christmas. How can we make home feel safe yeah. for when you visit? Yeah. Well, and I think with that comes what boundaries need to be set. Is this a family member or friend of the family that is still um, connected to people yeah. in your life? Is it still somebody you see, like you said, on holidays? And if so, how do you navigate that in a way that you are protected and you feel safe? Right. And because this is such a serious topic, you need to understand your situation at times requires a very serious decision. Yeah. And that's not an easy thing to make. Well, I would say first of all, then if you are not the person who has been abused or if you are being abused, but there's someone in your care, right? Who is also being abused. Their safety is the most important thing. I see people get lost in the haze of competing values. Like one of my values is I believe our family should stick together. Yeah. One of our values is I believe that we should, that love and forgiveness are great things. Mm -hmm. And like, those are great values to have, but the, the priorities are off. If we're saying, well, keeping the family together comes at the cost of a child continuing to be abused yeah. or protecting one another because we're family means I'm going to protect the abuser over the person who's being abused and protect mm -hmm. their reputation or you know, protect them from legal repercussions or what have you. Not everything has the same weight. So we're gonna make this really, really easy. Protecting the person being abused is more important than literally anything mm -hmm. else. Correct. And if that means your family breaks apart, if that means that there is a teenage child who goes and lives with other family or goes to foster care because you have young children who are in danger and it breaks your heart to send your teenager away, you still do it. If it means you leave your partner, you do it. If you go to a shelter, you do it. And those are hard decisions to make, but it gets easier the more you stop wondering, like, what's the right call? I mean, would you agree that's always the right call? Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. single time. And if you have failed to protect your child before, they can see now that you will protect them. Yeah. Right? And that counts for a lot. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge knowing that you do have somebody that will protect you when you're a child and these things are happening. Yeah. Yeah. This is an issue that transcends race, culture, religion, sexuality. It doesn't happen in any one faith group. It doesn't happen in any one racial group. It doesn't happen just, you know, with heterosexual parents. Like it happens. This, this is everywhere. So how do we heal from childhood sexual abuse by a family member? There's a great book called Miss America by day about one of the winners of Miss America was sexually abused by her father for years. And telling her story, even though she was, I mean, she was so successful and she was so admired and for her to say, this happened to me, gave power and voices to a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And so if you are looking to heal from sexual abuse, the first step is to take care of yourself. I mean, that, that's, and that, and that whole process. So the first lots of steps, 
But then turning outward, can you be an advocate to other people who have been in that situation? Because it often feels very lonely and it feels very scary and that people don't understand or that people will judge you, that you can be to somebody else, someone who doesn't judge, someone who walks them through the process, someone who's there for them. And then going a step further, you know, Alicia helped me have a major paradigm shift. I used mm -hmm. to think of trauma and abuse as the healing process is I, I go from victim to advocate, right? Mm -hmm. Or victim to survivor. It's very empowering and I'm now in this powerful place. And Alicia said to me, even if, but if you're an advocate and a survivor and that's it, you're still being defined mm -hmm. by the abuse. Mm -hmm. It's a positive way, but it's still like who I am comes down to the fact that I was abused. Going one step further into, I'm going to build a life for myself. Like, do I want to go to college? Do I want to become a dancer? What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? That I haven't lost that just because these terrible things have happened to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I can that. still I have a life. I want to my life. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And to that end, what we do here at Mended Light is help people with that process. Our trauma program that we have created that you would be guided through with our therapist, the whole point is go from victim to survivor to... Thriver. Thriver. Like, yeah. To really, thriver. Yeah. To who do you want to be? That's, that's why we are called Mended Light. You feel like your light's been diminished or broken. What you were able to shine to the world has been taken away from you and we want to give it back to you. So if this is you, if this is the circumstance that you're in, I'd like to invite you to schedule a complimentary 15 minute consultation with Jessica if you live outside of the state of Utah or Chase if you live within the state of Utah and get started. Get started on your road to recovery. They are here to help you. Some of you watching may wonder, do I have trauma? Does this qualify like, or am I overthinking it? Well, we've got a video in our Ask a Therapist series how do I know if I have trauma where I deep dive in that? You can watch that right over Chase's head. <laughs> Strength in numbers. If there, any of you have uh, experienced trauma and are willing to share your experience, uh, please leave a comment below. Yeah, let us know. Let us know what you've been through and what's gotten you through it. Everyone's going to benefit from your experience. And of course, if you have more questions for us, you can also leave those in the comments below and maybe we'll pick yours for one of our next videos. If you're lucky. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us. And here is that video we were telling you about. So now you know what you're doing for the next 10 or 15 minutes. You're welcome. <laughs>